Um, so good evening. Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. My name is Beth Saunders. I'm the curator and head of special collections in the library gallery here at UMBC. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's public event accompanying the library gallery's current exhibition, Louis Palou, Distant Early Warning, um, which is on view through May 20th. So please, you know, tell your friends and family to come back. This presentation of photographs is from a multi-year project by Canadian-American photojournalist Louis Palou, and it provides a look at evolving militarization in the North American Arctic driven by invented narratives and imagined threats. Palou's work has been supported by funding from the John Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, National Geographic Magazine, and the Pulitzer Center, and the presentation of this exhibition and public program is supported by a project grant from the Baltimore County Commission on the Arts and Sciences and an arts program grant from the Maryland State Arts Council. Before introducing today's panel, I'd like to extend my gratitude to several people who made this presentation of Distant Early Warning possible. Um, first, I'd like to thank the curator, Emily Cullen, for bringing Louis' work to UMBC and organizing such an elegant and thought-provoking presentation. I would also like to thank Emily, Jared Christensen, and Larry Halver for the beautiful installation. And I'm very appreciative of everyone in special collections, Susan Graham, Lindsay Laper, Lorraine Ojo Ohipare, and Robin Martin for their support and expertise. And of course, foremost, I want to thank Louis for entrusting us with this important body of work. So, once considered nearly impenetrable, the Arctic is losing roughly 21,000 square miles of ice each year and warming faster than any other place on the planet. As climate change melts its icy armor, the region is taking on strategic importance. Today's discussion explores contemporary geopolitics and geology in the Arctic from a variety of artistic, scholarly, and scientific perspectives. Our panelists will address topics ranging from new scientific methods for measuring and analyzing the influence of sea ice thickness on the climate, the future of national competition and claims over the Arctic region, and the impact of climate change on indigenous, indigenous communities in the Arctic. There's going to be time at the end for Q&A, uh, but first I'd like to introduce the panelists, welcome our speakers. Louis Palou is a photographer and filmmaker whose work has examined social political issues such as human rights and conflict for over 30 years. He's a 2016 Guggenheim Foundation Fellow and was awarded the 2019 Arnold Newman Prize for New Directions in Portraiture. His work has appeared in National Geographic Magazine, The New York Times, The Washington Post Magazine, BBC, The Guardian, Der Spiegel, and El Pais, and is held in numerous collections, including the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and the National Gallery of Art. And he is very recently a 2022 World Press Photo Competition winner. Congratulations, Louis. Dr. Brian Grodsky is a professor of comparative politics and chair of the political science department at UMBC. His research interests include various aspects of democratization and human rights, as well as the politics of disaster response and climate change. His books include The Costs of Justice, University of Notre Dame Press, 2010, Social Movements, and The New State, The Fate of Pro-Democracy Organizations When Democracy is Won by Stanford University Press, and The Democratization Disconnect. Dr. Nathan Kurtz is the chief of NASA's Cryospheric Sciences Laboratory, deputy project scientist for NASA ISAT-2 satellite mission, and a UMBC alum. He received his PhD in atmospheric physics in 2009. His research involves remote sensing of the polar regions with an emphasis on the use of laser and radar altimetry data to study the impact of sea ice on the climate. He's traveled to both the Arctic and Antarctic numerous times as part of ship-based and airborne field campaigns. Um, so we have a really exciting and broad uh, range of expertise tonight, which I think is going to bring some exciting perspectives um, to the topic. So before you know, we really delve into the discussion, I thought it would be helpful to kind of ground everybody to have the panelists say a little bit about how their work um, has brought them to the Arctic, um, what their work is about. So we're going to take about five minutes each. Um, and I'm going to ask Louie to start. And I have this one slide to represent Louis's work, but you're literally surrounded by it. Um, so Louis, I'll let you take it away. This is the first, this is the best uh, 
slideshow I've ever had to put together uh, on the walls here. Thanks, uh, first of all, to UMBC, uh, Emily and Beth, and my two panelists for being here, and uh, everybody coming here for this really important conversation about a place in the world that seems so far away but is so connected to how we enjoy our lives and our security every day. Um, you know, at least for my generation, I remember the Cold War, there was always, it's like that film Dr. Strangelove, you know, there's like this thing out there, it's like the unknown, and back then, the idea was in the Cold War that the shortest route of attack to the United States was over the pole, uh, so missile or bomber from the Soviet Union, so they built a radar line called the, the Dew Line, or the Distant Early Warning Line, and now it's called the North Warning System, still in operation, um, and after covering like Afghanistan, all these wars we hear about in the news, even like say Ukraine, where I also have worked, I just wondered what happened to this like imagined front line, like all these military installations and what, what is probably the largest construction project in the history of the Arctic. What, what does it look like? What's going on up there? And when we think about threats, you know, I always think of the history of the exploration of the Arctic and its connection actually to Baltimore. And so it made me think of the Franklin Expedition. And if you don't know about the Franklin Expedition, in the 1800s, the British were looking for a shorter route to get from, from the UK to Asia. And because back then there was no Panama Canal, you'd have to go like below South America or around Africa. And so they took these two ships, went up into the Arctic, disappeared, perished, and for decades they didn't realize what had happened to them. Now, one of these ships was called the HMS Terror. The HMS Terror was a bomb ship that in 1814 bombed Fort McHenry while Francis Scott Key wrote the national anthem. So it's this, this threat, this idea of a place that could attack the United States. And eventually it was turned into an exploration ship, went up into the Arctic and was destroyed by nature. And I just think that there's sort of a story in there that tells us about what threats are and what they can become and which are the existential ones and which are the ones that we don't have to actually put all our resources into. So that's kind of where I went with this work about invented threats and ideas of narratives about what the Arctic is and what it is not. Thanks, Louis. Um, so next up, I'm going to ask Nathan um, to take over. And here is a little quicker for our slides. All right. Thanks, Beth. Um, and yeah, thanks for uh, Louis and uh, Brian for joining us on the panel. So. I am a UMBC alum. I spent many hours in this very library studying for finals. Uh, <laughs> good and bad memories, it's, it's brought me far. But um, I, I began studying uh, in the physics department, um, studying uh, atmospheric physics, um, which led me to my current job at, at NASA, which is really using physics to study changes in climate, specifically the, the cryosphere. And so, I uh, want to start out talking with Louis again about trying to distinguish ice. There's actually different kinds of ice uh, in the Arctic and the Antarctic, uh, and they impact the climate in different ways, and they, they manifest in different ways. So uh, here, uh, typically, I think people usually think of ice on the land, like the, the Greenland ice sheet, uh, the, the big ice caps on the Canadian uh, archipelago. So that forms over thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years where just snow falls on the, the ground, it starts to accumulate, it doesn't melt, uh, it starts to compact as it gets really, really thick, uh, and once the snow compacts so much, it, it turns into ice. And so you get a big dome shaped over the land, gravity is always pushing that ice out, out to the land. And so it's this constant cycle of the ice being uh, pushed out to the land, out to the ocean, breaking off going uh, uh, into the, the ocean. If you have an imbalance of the amount of water and ice that's, that's falling on the land, um, then that will change the, the sea level. So we study uh, ice on the, the land in particular from NASA because we want to track how is sea level changing, what's impacting uh, where we expect sea level to change, especially in the next 100 years. Uh, what I study more uh, importantly is sea ice. And so this is different. It's not the ice that's flowing away from the land. It's actually the ice that forms from the ocean water itself. You get the very cold temperatures uh, in the Arctic. Uh, and it forms this mixed layer. So it doesn't have to cool the entire ocean column. 
Like usually you see in uh, smaller bodies of water where the entire column has to cool before you start, start getting ice. Uh, but it, so it cools enough and ice starts to, to form on the surface. And so this is just a picture I took from the air uh, near Greenland uh, a number of years back from a uh, plane. You can see the ice that broke off from the land here, these big icebergs, and then the much, much thinner sea ice. It's just a, you know, a few feet thick uh, comparatively. So the Earth's sea ice cover, it uh, shrinks and it uh, expands throughout the seasons. And so this is typically what it, it looks like uh, in the Arctic and the Antarctic. They're at uh, opposite phases. So at any given time, uh, sea ice covers about 4% of the Earth's surface. Uh, and the Arctic in particular uh, has a, a very different geography than the, the Antarctic. The Arctic, because you don't have land here at the, the North Pole, uh, the ice tends to be much thicker, whereas around the Antarctic, the ice is much more free to expand. And because most of the ice, is, or the, the land is at the pole, you get much thinner ice. So it's very unique systems between the two. We do study uh, the ice for a very important reason. So sea ice is essentially an air conditioner for the planet. Uh, it's very bright, it's white, so it reflects a lot of the sun's radiation. Uh, what we've seen, again, is, is the uh, amplification of global warming in the Arctic. So we're seeing uh, temperatures rising about three to four times the global average in the Arctic. So this is just a, a map of temperature anomalies just for uh, a half year period. But you can see this big red blob in the Arctic where they're much, much warmer uh, than the rest of the planet. And this is because of this, what's called the ice albedo feedback, where when you start losing ice, you expose the, the dark ocean surface, you get more radiation absorbed, so it increases the temperature, leads to more ice loss, and so you get this feedback effect. Uh, sea ice also impacts the global ocean circulation. If we didn't have sea ice, we wouldn't have uh, life in the, the, the bottom parts of the ocean. And that's because near the poles, uh, in specific regions of the Antarctic and the Arctic, you have uh, sea ice formation actually leads to the sinking of the water from the surface, which has things like uh, dissolved nutrients, oxygen, and it sinks all the way down to the bottom. And so that's driving this very deep global ocean circulation. Sea ice has been in decline in the Arctic very, very dramatically since we've been tracking it with, with satellite data uh, since 1979. Uh, if you paid attention to the headlines, usually September is the minimum period for sea ice uh, extent in the Arctic, and it's dropping. We've seen most of the last minimum extents of sea ice in just the last decade. And so this is just where the sea ice, all these colors used to cover in 1979, and then the record low here in 2012. So you see a staggering amount of ice lost. Um, this has been directly linked to carbon dioxide increase, and we can actually put a, a number, about three square meters of September sea ice loss per metric ton of CO2 emission. Uh, and so end result is that we're looking at a, an ice-free summer in the Arctic in possibly the next 20 or 30 years. So what I do is not just tracking uh, extent anymore, uh, work with uh, series of satellite laser and radar altimeters, um, and we're actually trying to track how thick is the ice. And so we've had this time series of, of looking at, well, this shrinking ice cover, uh, but it's really just like a 2D picture. This is trying to put a, a 3D uh, uh, perspective on, on the ice loss. And so at NASA, we launched a satellite called ISAT-2, the Ice Cloud and Land Elevation Satellite. Uh, it's the second generation, uh, it's a laser very sensitive, sophisticated laser. Uh, it fires out a laser pulse, it's split into six different beams, uh, and then we actually counting individual photons from the surface, putting those together statistically to track the, the surface height and elevation. We can convert that into how thick the ice is based on how much is floating above the water. Uh, and then we put that into context with different records from different satellites. And again, we're, we've seen about a third of the sea ice volume lost from satellites since we've been taking measurements uh, around 2004. So uh, a lot of technology being put towards studying the, the Arctic, uh, and we're seeing pretty dramatic changes in it. 
Thank you so much. Um, so Brian, if you don't mind delving into a little bit of the politics. Yeah, of sure. The region. I'll give you guys a, a little background. So thanks again, Beth and, and of course Nathan and Louie, especially for bringing this uh, presentation here. It's incredible. Um, I am a fellow ice lover, like these two. Uh, I don't know if we love ice as much as Nathan, but I think we've probably come pretty close. Um, I, I got involved in the Arctic. I've been involved in Russian politics for a very long time, since the 1990s. Uh, and uh, I recently became much more involved in disasters. Um, it threw, uh oh. Okay. Uh, on the side, I, I do search and rescue, and I've been a volunteer firefighter at EMT forever. Um, and so I started to put these things together, and I came up with a project to work on disasters in the Arctic. Um, unfortunately, the funding cycle was kind of destroyed by COVID, and so I never got up to start the project. But basically what I'm looking at is how indigenous um, communities have been able to, in different countries, try to get political weight behind their demands for um, redress for some of these things that they're facing, in particular relocations. Um, that's been a very big topic. Alaska has a large number of communities that need to get uh, relocated. Um, Canada has a couple um, that need to be relocated in part. Um, and then Russia has a handful as well. Um, so hopefully that project will, will take off sooner or later. Um, I wanted to give you a quick background into Arctic geopolitics. Um, so just as, as background here, we're talking about roughly an area with 15% of the world's landmass when we're talking about the Arctic with about 4 million inhabitants. Um, there are actually about 500 million people who live in Arctic states, including ours, we would be considered an Arctic state. We don't feel it. The Canadians consider themselves Arctic. The Russians definitely consider them, themselves Arctic. Um, the Scandinavians as well. We tend not to, and that has a very meaningful um, impact on our policy. We have largely neglected the Arctic with the exception of stealing a bunch of oil, taking, extracting a bunch of oil um, and minerals from Alaska. But in terms of um, military, I mean, the dew line is one of the few things, you know, that we've been concerned about. We don't really have a lot of capacity um, to fight up in the Arctic, or, um, so that's important as well. Um, when, uh, when I talk about the Arctic and the disasters that are pending, I think a lot of us have heard about the th sorts of things that we're talking about. But of course, we're talking about rising sea levels and flooding in these communities, um, eroding coastlines. Um, also changes in the sea ice, which affect how people make the, live. live. Um, you have to keep in mind that these places are incredibly expensive um, to live in, and the indigenous populations are a colonized, essentially sort of experiencing a decolonization in multiple respects um, sort of population, um, but they've, a, a lot of their way of life has been oriented, has been reoriented, um, but they essentially, many of these communities still survive um, thanks to um, traditional ways of life in terms of, of whale hunting um, and other marine animals and, and other animals in general. Um, and this is important um, because it's so expensive to live there without these resources. Uh, and as we find changes in the sea ice, it becomes more difficult to get um, these things. We've got permafrost thaw, which is literally destroying buildings um, and cities, entire cities in Russia, um, and changing migration and hunting patterns um, and all that. So the Arctic um, is definitely a, a place of geopolitical contention, and increasingly so. Um, when you look at um, the reasons, there are three, I would say three, maybe four big reasons. Um, the first one is, is minerals um, and hydrocarbons. The second is shipping routes. And the third is, uh, the third is fishing. Um, and then, of course, there are military um, reasons as well. Um, as Louis mentioned, the, the shortest way to get from Russia to Canada or the United States is right over the Arctic um, and vice versa. So this is a security, has a security dimension as well. Um, what we found when it comes to the hydrocarbons, uh, they, they estimate that about 22% um, of the undiscovered yet uh, conventional oil and natural um, gas resources are actually up in the Arctic. And so this has led to a lot of interest. Um, historically, it's been really hard to get at this stuff. Um, it's becoming increasingly less difficult to get at it because the ice is melting. Um, when it comes to shipping, the northern sea route, which is the one that goes through uh, Russian Arctic waters, could reduce the sailing distance for some routes by up to 40%. Um, when you talk about the, the Northwest Passage, we're talking about 25 to 35%, depending on where you're going. Um, this has a lot of shippers looking that direction. Um, and with shipping comes increased risk 
um, because of all the environmental issues, because you don't have a lot of support, search and rescue, but also cleanup. Um, and when, you know, when Nathan talks about that, um, the, the feedback loops, imagine belching all this nastiness into the air, um, melting more ice and turning it dark and that, that melts, et cetera. So um, we have a lot of concerns there. Um, and finally, with respect to fishing, uh, da, 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 sorry, there's my little shipping slide. Um, there are increasingly new areas for fishing. The last time I checked, and this is several years back, um, Arctic fishing accounted for about 10% of the global catch. Um, there, there are estimates, fairly recent estimates, that an increase in the temperature of one degree Celsius can raise the average fishing value by approximately 15% in the area as you have um, fish migrating that direction. Um, and so this, all these things create um, a possibility of increasing conflict. Um, and what we find in the Arctic, I would say, is more talk of conflict, um, but you see a lot more cooperation to date. Um, that cooperation has a long history um, to around the time of the, uh, the end of the Soviet period when Gorbachev became much more open. Um, and it's focused on what we call sort of the soft issues, um, like the environment, um, like energy, um, like cooperation on search and rescue and shipping, um, things like coordination things. It has, has very clearly omitted um, security. And so that's something that uh, it will have to be dealt with at some point. Um, and uh, there are a number of, of problems that we can expect. Um, these countries see the Arctic in very different ways. For Russia, they are an Arctic power, and they think that the Arctic um, is very much within their security um, priority. Um, the United States hasn't looked that way. Canadians, um, ha especially under Harper and, and, um, and moving forward, have really looked um, that, that way uh, more so, um, and they've done a lot more in that area. Um, just to put this in perspective, the United States has one and a half uh, 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 oh my God, uh, the icebreakers. Um, there's about one and a half, and Russia has dozens. Um, the United States is building more icebreakers, uh, but it's, it's sort of a long-term project. Um, so this is a highly strategic area, and it's increasingly contentious. There, there are um, differences um, in how we approach um, some of these issues in terms of resolution. And um, there are very clearly differences in who has claims to what territory. Thank you so much. I think um, this is really helpful to see how complex um, the Arctic is, the situation there. I think kind of piggybacking on the your last comments, Brian, I'm I'm interested in the fact that you're saying to date this sort of, as Louis points out, the like imagined threats that exist in the Arctic, they are imagined. So um, it's been called a new Cold War, uh, what's going on in the Arctic. And I'm curious, particularly now, given Russia's invasion of Ukraine, what does that statement get right or wrong about the actual situation today in the Arctic? Is that directed at me? Anyone who wants to answer. I'll, I'll take it for a second, and I'll just say that um, now that Finland and Sweden are increasingly interested in NATO membership, um, that's going to drive more conflict potentially um, in the Arctic, because Russia has made it very clear for the last two decades that NATO is the biggest threat that it faces. Um, and part of the Ukraine war is about NATO. Um, and so that, that could drive conflict in the Arctic. It's... I don't think a lot of people expect to see open conflict in the Arctic anytime soon. It's very difficult to fight in the Arctic. You had experience up there, right? Um, in terms of with military, it's incredibly difficult. Yeah, I think one general said that any land army that would try and invade over the North Pole would become this largest search and rescue operation in the history of the world. Well, just because it's far and it's not like a smooth sheet of ice you can just drive your car or snowmobile down. It is vast and... I sometimes have people do funny microaggressions like, oh, yeah, I'm from Minnesota. It's just cold. I'm like, yeah, but you can go in your house. Depending on where you are in the Arctic, and I'm going to add a dimension to this in a moment, talking about Scandinavian countries, is the Arctic is a hundred different things. It's not all one place. It's not all vast emptiness either. So, like, if we're talking about North American Arctic, which is what these photos are from, so, like, Alaska, Canada, Greenland, uh, when you go up in the archipelago and you go out on the land, 
You can't just be like, I'm cold and going inside like when you're in Minnesota. When you go up there, you're up there. That's it. You got to know how to survive. Uh, but then I could be in the Arctic in Norway and go take a yoga class and drive a sports car up a very modern highway. And, you know, and there is actually, there are trees. You know, there, we have a tree line that kind of ends the permafrost. Finland has trees past the Arctic Circle. So it's a very different place. And the thing about that part of the world versus ours is... There was a war in the Arctic in the Second World War. Finland and Russia fought in, in the late 30s, and the Finns have not forgotten that war. And they've been ready for war with Russia ever since. It is a highly militarized country. Uh, it doesn't seem like that, and they are not in NATO because Russia has exerted pressure to never join NATO. Same with Sweden, who is now, after a long time, so it's not... A big secret, but no one really knows that I have a part to this project that has been underway for several years in the Scandinavian countries. So I've been work covering Norway, Finland, and Sweden, and the sweet the Swedish military with a little bit of humor is like, we got to come back out of peace damage. That's what they're calling it, peace damage, because they just stopped having a military, and so they're rebuilding their military and they're learning from the Norwegians, mostly the Finns actually, for this war and. It's really interesting to see how nature plays a part in that. Because if you look at the composition of Finland on the Russian border, there are hardly any roads through the middle of Finland that go to the Russian border. It's a big wall of trees, pretty much. And there's a highway, but on the top and the bottom, one in the middle. And it's sort of like the terrain in the Arctic. To understand the terrain and to use nature as a defensive weapon. That was funny. My buddies from Canada. Yeah, just flying by. <laughs> putting landmines in the grass where you walk. Uh, and, and it's just, it's a very interesting, you know, shift. There's a thing, not to make it too, because it is complex, there's the Arctic Council, which is kind of like, let's make it simple, like a United Nations of Arctic countries, of the seven Arctic nations. There's been a huge status change where the other countries do not want to deal with or have Russia be a part of it anymore. And Russia's like, hey, just because of Ukraine, let's not stop collaborating in the Arctic. And so it becomes complicated because there's all these treaties like, where can you fish? Where can you sail? What do you mean there's a claim into my part of the Arctic? And Russia's like, yeah, but we got this under underwater continental shelf, which is like an underwater extension of Russia to the North Pole. So we're soft saying the North Pole could be ours. And these are some of the plays that are going on in a place with, back to the question about, Imagine futures where there's no ice in the Arctic and suddenly I can sail from, you know, Murmansk across to the top of Canada. So these are sort of all the complex moves going on and everybody thinking, well, how is this going to play out? And so what's a security threat like? Canada started making laws that certain types of heavy fuel for ships cannot sail in their waters. Mm -hmm. So even if the Northwest Passage is considered an international waterway that other countries do not have to honor to Canada. They can say, yeah, but we have a law about this fuel and you can't sail here anymore. So there's all these different strategies of how they're securing. Like, what, what are we supposed to secure here? The fish, the ice, the roots. So it's, it's become quite complex with the whole dimension of Russia with Ukraine. Because it's not just, could they attack us? Will they even honor a basic treaty? And I think that that's what's kind of broken a system that has survived up until this moment. Mm -hmm. I guess I would add a scientific perspective. We want to collaborate with Russia, Russian scientists. They've, they've done quite extensive research in the Arctic. The U.S. is not allowed, like I as a government scientist am not allowed to collaborate with Russia. Uh, and so uh, it really limits where we're able to study in the Arctic. Um, I go to places like Alaska or Greenland. The U.S. has a very big military base in northern Greenland. I'm going there in a few weeks. Uh, as Louis said, it, it has no fence around this base. There's a very natural fence. Uh, but in some ways, we're fortunate that the military has a presence there because they allow us to conduct science research from those bases. Uh, and so we're able to, to conduct research, again, more around the U.S. Uh, and Canada but there's still this big half of the Arctic that we really don't have access to because uh, it's classified as, as Russian airspace um, and we're not allowed to collaborate with Russian scientists that would enable us to get access to that. Uh, there are some exceptions. Like I was actually on the uh, Russian icebreaker which planted the flag at the North Pole, not when it did this, but just as, as part of another project. Uh, but this, I think, is kind of a special exception. It was just 
taking me back home, essentially. And it was the only, <laughs> it was the only uh, ship that was going back home. So, um, but, but that's it. There are, yeah, quite a bit of limitations just on this, the science side, too. Can I just mention something? Because oh, um, Louis brought up something really important, which is these competing claims over, it's actually the Lomonosov Ridge, um, and who, whose continental shelf it belongs to. So this is all according to the law of the sea. If your continental shelf stretches out this far, this could be part of your territory. This whole, this entire sea area can be part of yours. And so there are competing claims between Russia, Canada, and um, Denmark. And there are, Denmark's based on Greenland, right? And so when, if Greenland, and at some point Greenland will become independent, Denmark will no longer be an Arctic state. And um, we'll go from the Arctic 8 to the Arctic 7. Um, well, un unless, of course, Greenland stays in the Arctic Council, which it probably will. So we'll see the Arctic 8, but Denmark will be out. Um, but so this is all playing out in a very tedious international law way. In other words, it's going to take years and years because they're they're way behind in line in terms of who who gets um, uh, who gets refereed first. Um, there's a commission that looks at all these, and it's not just the Arctic; it's all over the world. And so there, there's this isn't going to be decided for a long time. But what made me think about it is Nathan's uh, bringing science back into it, which is that these Canada, Russia. Um, Denmark, they've spent lots of money trying to explore the ocean floor to say that this is our continental shelf. And so there are all these competing claims, but it's based on science so far and not military might. Um, Russia's made it clear recently that it, it doesn't necessarily stick with the international rules anymore, though. Yeah, I just want to add one more thing. When we think about the military, too, it's not just about guns and shooting and missiles. Like It's like he talked about. Because the military needs to go to places and do the things they need to do, they also have a lot of resources where there are there is not a single military operation that doesn't look at the weather. The weather is kind of one of the first things they look at before they do anything. And I think that that angle of the, what the military does outside of sort of the tactical side, they have developed airplanes that can land. I've been to the bases in Greenland. They've developed things, you know, one of the main uh, Air Force bases is in, actually connected in New York where you fly out and they have these like skis that are on the bottom of the C-130s and they've innovated like submarines that go up in the Arctic as well. You, you got to think beyond what, what they study, like water quality. There's all these ways of gathering information about the nature that will affect how they operate there. And the only way a lot of ways journalists and anyone can get there is because <laughs> it is this extreme place where only the military has the equipment to get there. And they do provide that that resource, which I think is really valuable, actually. I think my mic has died, so I'm just going to speak up. Um, so a lot of the conversation has been about national national interests, which of course makes sense, but, you know, Brian, earlier your slide talking about, you know, increased opportunities for mineral extraction, trade routes, um, increased fisheries, clearly brings in, opens things up for private interests as well. Um, and I'm just kind of interested to hear more about how you see the, the connections between the national interests, private interests, if there are already um, private companies starting to operate and to build infrastructure in the Arctic for um, these eventual opportunities. And then um, with the scientists as well, it, it seems like a lot of the scientific research is government funded, but perhaps there are also scientists working for private companies as well. Let's go in reverse order this time. <laughs> reverse. I <laughs> uh, have not seen too much private funding for or private uh, entities, I guess, looking at the Arctic. I, I, I think I've heard of some, maybe more indirectly. Uh, I know. One example, uh, flying near Alaska um, over the sea ice, just looking out the window of the plane and seeing this big oil rig. <laughs> uh, so obviously for, for things like that, I, I know private companies have been interested in, in studying the ice properties and uh, phenomena around that uh, so that they can expand, especially oil drilling. That's, that's the main uh, Thing that I've heard. Uh, I guess one one story I do know is that uh, on one of our missions, I, I used to run an airborne mission called Operation Icebridge, which flew all over the Arctic. One of the instruments that we had on board, it's a very sensitive measurement uh, to detect 
gravity anomalies. It's called a gravimeter. Uh, we use it to fly over places that are covered by ice shelves and try to detect the ocean bottom floor. Where is the bottom floor so that we can model it? How is this, this going to behave? Uh, this instrument is primarily supported from, for uh, oil and mineral exploitation. They want to fly this instrument uh, to detect, you know, is there oil here? Are there valuable minerals? And so we're able to actually use this instrument um, kind of on loan or, or I guess maybe cheaper than the, the private companies do. So it's kind of had this indirect benefit uh, in talking with the operators. Uh, usually a, it's a Canadian company that we work with. They talk about, you know, their most of their normal jobs and they're, they're happy to do something scientific every now and then, but it's not, not the norm for them. So I would say the largest operating oil field in the United States is in the north slope of Alaska. It, it's been there for decades and actually, and this is just fact, this is not me promoting anything to do with oil. Um, and the pipeline from, from the top of Alaska down to the bottom, I've driven the entire length of it, has been there since the 70s actually. Uh, that's all obviously private. Uh, one thing you'll find in Canada is Canada is a very much a, a mining country. You know, uh, the Toronto Stock Exchange probably has the highest percentage of natural resource listings in the world. And Canada's, in terms of knowledge engineering and actual hard rock mines, when I say hard rock mines, that's not coal mines. So gold, copper, nickel, uh, uranium. Canada's probably in the top three of almost all those metals. Uh, like Russia, they have a vast resource base. A lot of those things are like nickel, you know. There's 20, 20 different metals in your phones alone um, that come from all over the world, not just Canada or Russia. But when you get into the Arctic, uh, say up the west shore of Hudson's Bay, Agnico Eagle is a very big mining company. Gold's at what now? $2,000 an ounce. There are a number of gold mines up that way. Uh, what I'm hearing is there's not a, it is still mining. There is still, you know, everything that comes with mining but they've taken a much more modern approach. And it seems like I've only heard that of past uh, mining companies, they've operated a lot well with local communities, especially Inuit communities. Um, a lot of the diamond mines are on the mainland of Canada. And there's a couple of mines and there's a very big iron ore mine, a high grade iron ore mine on Baffin Island, which is the island that is parallel across from Greenland. So there are, there is existing mining, quite a bit of existing mining. Um, Fishing is probably, I think, I forgot what the percentage was, but I believe it's 40 to 50% of U.S. fishing is Alaska. And I think that fishing is going to become more and more a topic of who gets to fish in our waters, what are people doing near our waters that could affect our fishing. And I, I do believe that, you know, back to narratives, a lot of people don't realize that in the Second World War, Japan attacked Alaska and occupied half the Aleutian Islands. There's a really famous battle that doesn't get talked about. It's like opening a second front, and the United States and Canada fought the Japanese off the Aleutian Islands. There's all these like lost histories about conflict in the Arctic. The Aleutians aren't quite up in the Arctic; it's like subarctic. But you know these ideas of these kind of you know lost histories that we don't really know much about. Um, but uh, and when it comes to Greenland, I'm not sure there's been a lot of, if any, real oil or mining yet. I think there was a uranium discovery there and there's talk about it and there are like it's it's becoming one of these like clashes that's dividing people like we want the jobs we don't want the jobs we like the way it is we don't you know and so I think that that's that's something that's happening in Greenland that's different from the rest there's like different politics whereas I think Alaska's mostly just oil mm -hmm. yeah so I, I know in Greenland there have been some Chinese investments um, and they've been very unpopular because the Chinese have a habit, and I've seen this in Central, I work in Central Asia as well, and I've seen it there, where they will bring in lots of Chinese workers, um, their own workers, in other words, um, and that was very unpopular um, in Greenland. Um, the idea being, if, if you have investments, let's let the local population gain from these investments. Um, I, I wanted to mention, in terms of oil and gas, um, that some of these countries, I mean, like Russia, for example, um, is is very much the state has a, a commanding share of the companies that go there, but where foreign in, where uh, economic private economic interests come in and private um, oil and gas companies is where they need the technology. Um, they don't have the technology to get through certain areas. It's just very difficult to do some of this drilling, especially up in the icier areas. Um, and they need money. After 2014, we sanctioned um, Russia for its first invasion of Ukraine. 
pretty pathetic sanctions, honestly, um, but they did have a bite when it came to some of the Arctic operations. Um, so what did the Russians do? Well, they looked down to China, and China happily um, came up with some money. Um, I'm not sure about the techno technological expertise, um, but they definitely did a lot of the financing um, because China is very power hungry, power as in resource hungry. It needs Russian um, oil and gas um, to keep its economy going. Um, when we talk about shipping, there's been, when you think about private interest, there have been a lot of shipping companies from places and, and also ship builders in places like Korea, Japan, um, and, uh, and probably many other countries. Those are the ones that stick in my head. Um, and they put pressure on their governments to be more active in, in the Arctic. And on that note, I do want to say that the Arctic Council represents the Arctic Eight, but they also have non-member states that are participants. Um, and China has made it very clear that the Arctic is not the Arctic Eight's domain. Um, that it considers the high Arctic international. Um, and so that will have, um, that might break the, um, the Russian-Chinese um, friendly relationship if it lasts long enough into that period where shipping becomes more of a, a, a thing going on there. What I just would add, and I think you brought it up, is the reason why this is happening in the Arctic and not in the Antarctic is because all these countries actually have land inside the Arctic Whereas down in Antarctica, although you're starting to see narrative shape with Australia and say Argentina and those countries because they're closer, is there are no countries with direct uh, direct land inside the, the Antarctic sort of sphere of influence. So this is why th th there's a competing claim over that big empty piece in the middle and to be able to exploit that. Something I think you mentioned China is unknowns, you know, like building fake islands in the South China Sea. What's going to, I mean, I don't think you can go, but who knows? I'm going to just build a base on, on top of the North Pole and make it ours. Like, this is what, when you're in the military, you're thinking like, what, what, the what ifs? And I want to be ready for that, right? So. And you could easily imagine them starting something for scientific research and then it takes on a different character. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about indigenous people living in the Arctic? Um, and the extent to which they're brought into these political discussions, and obviously cooperation has been a big part of everything that everyone we've been discussing. Is it cooperation? Is it one-sided, the relationship? Um, and I, I recognize we're talking about lots of di different indigenous groups, but maybe ones that you've worked on and with. Do you want to start? Sure. So when we think about the Arctic, the, the largest population of anyone in the Arctic is probably, as a city, is Murmansk in Russia. It's like over 300,000 people, something in and around there off the top of my head. And so, again, the Arctic is a diverse place. But when you get to Canada, the majority of, of people who are, live and are from the Arctic are Inuit. And then you get to Alaska, it's Inupiat. And then when you get to, the, you know, Finland, the Sami, and across to Russia, there are a lot of diverse indigenous groups. Uh, with Canada... There's a very long, dark history of colonialism, obviously. Some of the people who are in the Arctic were moved from other parts of the mainland up into part of the Arctic in that early part of the Cold War for Canada to say, see, there are Canadians up there, and to take people from the mainland and the tree line, put them up in a place where a lot of them died. Yes, it's a very long, dark history, actually. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. If, you know, when you're a journalist, you have to learn how to see things, right? So when you see wood in the Arctic... There is no wood in the Canadian Arctic. That's from the south. That's a colonial material. Original dog sleds, when you learn from the Inuit elders, were made from animal parts frozen with water. There were no cities back then because the, the Inuit were, were uh, nomads. They, they, they traveled around. They had little communities they'd set up during the seasons, but there were no cities. All of these, these things that are constructed, like guns, you know, a snowmobiles or snow machines as they call them up there. You know, all of this, you know, this is all colonial sort of takeover, you can sort of say. Hudson's Bay Company, you know, religion, Catholicism, Christianity, all these things that are now very much a part of the fabric of these communities for a long time was total, in, in some ways, cultural destruction of, of some of these uh, indigenous groups. I think that obviously there's a big reckoning now. Uh, and what's happened is, is with the increase, now that the Arctic matters, you know, this, everything we're talking about, land claims, suddenly the soldiers are going up there and everybody's like, there's this whole history of testing op Arctic operations, like, 
I'm getting killed up here. You know, and it's like, hey, and this is what I feel is my greatest line is the the Inuit are the original scientists of the Arctic. They they know how to survive. When that Franklin expedition I told you about, they got crushed in the ice. They didn't follow the Inuit knowledge, and that's why they died. They didn't follow thousands of years of watching the wind, the ice, the animals, learning, you know, understanding as the that's Canadian geese is just surreal in the background here. Like, <laughs> yes, nature. Uh, they didn't embrace what is really the real true power in this world. So no such thing as political power, military power. I could, you know, it's incredible. Wind. Wind is the ultimate. It's not a weapon. Wind will destroy any jet fighter. Going up there, you see photos of them of crashed planes. Wind will take that plane and just that greatest invention, just smash it on the ground. The ice will crush any ship. And this is what I think is the most important thing is to understand that we are trying to manipulate and control the, the most powerful thing on this planet, which is not us, but nature itself. We are not destroying the planet. We are destroying the environment we need to live in. The planet is strong. It's going to survive past us. We just won't be able to live on it anymore. That's where we're headed. And I think that this, we get this human thing that we are this predominant, it's all ours. We're going to do whatever we want. Nature's going to have the last laugh because it's going to still be there just in a form that we won't be able to survive with anymore. So I think when we get sort of the indigenous people conversation, I think there's a big revelation now that there's this existential threat is like, how have they survived? Oh, they've been at one with nature and respected it all this time, you know? And so I think that when it really comes down to it, you're starting to see training where it's like, hey, you want to operate in the Arctic, you have to learn how to build an igloo. Not because that's an indigenous thing as a respect, it's because that is an ancient technology for surviving. You know, like the cliff bar of the Arctic is a piece of Arctic char in your pocket. Um, you know, I one day was, you know, it's incredible what we think is, we think this is technology, right? I remember I was above Hudson's Bay in the summer and there was just a tundra and this rock and, and this elder who I kind of said, just be my teacher. He said, there's this, cut up caribou, processed into pieces, and it was this landscape. And I was taking photos, he goes, do you know what you're taking a picture of? And I said, I'm doing a landscape, it's nature. He goes, no, this is a cutting board with meat in a refrigerator. And we are destroying the oldest refrigerator in the world because they can cut up these animals and carry raw meat and they can just eat it, you know, because the permafrost growing vegetables is very difficult. So that, that nutrition... We are destroying this refrigerator that has existed. And rocks are cutting boards. All this, this at one with nature. No need to make plastic cutting boards. They just do it on the rock. And that's where I think there's this like coming, coming to sort of understanding that this, this respecting nature, making a part of our security plans, part of the way we live and interact with the earth is sort of this awakening as we're starting to see where we're headed. I think that's a good point. And when we talk about climate science, there's been a lot of indigenous science that's come out way before, um, way before we were talking about climate change as a society, um, you know, talking about the changes in the quality of snow, talking about the changes in the temperatures and the way the animals are moving differently than they historically have been, which obviously is incredibly disruptive to these people, um, many of whom have been living in these areas for a very long time. Um, as Louis mentioned, many of them haven't. Many of them were, were relocated, especially in Canada and also in Russia um, uh, and in other places as well, but they were located for political reasons. Um, across the Arctic, the only thing I think I would add is that across the Arctic, indigenous populations are um, disproportionately poor. Um, they suffer from alcohol. It's, it's a lot like when you think of the Native American areas um, in the South, in, in, in the United States. Um, they are disproportionately uh, Poor alcoholism, depression, suicide, um, these things go on in every indig in the indigenous populations in every country because they suffered from forced assimilation, forced movements, um, they were uprooted um, mentally, and they, and they have a long history of being told that they are inferior, their culture is inferior. Um, and this has led to, in, in the science world, it's led to a decolonization of science. So when I was going to go up there to do this project that I have yet to get funding for because of COVID, um, it was a whole different, like I've done elite interviews in various parts of the world and elites are always happy to talk to you. You're going to be in a book, they're happy to talk to you, right? Um, here, it was, they made it very clear, you need to pay these people for their time. Um, it was, it was it, which almost for me felt unethical until I considered the unethical 
element of going up there and using these people's time in a way that they found, you know, were basically more extraction, right? Um, so you have to think a bit differently. Um, it's not the way, um, not the way I usually do business, um, but in these indigenous communities, it's the way you have to do business because they've been so exploited. Um, and so there's a lot of, there should be a lot of resentment. And as Lily mentioned, there's a, there's um, a lot being talked about. Canada had, I think, two reports in the last 10 years or so um, about their mistreatment. And we're going to find that from other places as well, probably not Russia. But the Sami in, in Sweden and well, Scandinavia, across Scandinavia have gone through the same thing. Um, I guess I would add, in my experience, had two very different experiences. So being in far northern Alaska, a place called Ukiavik, a uh, large native population, they sit the scientists down, they sit the, the visitors down, and, and they, they explain their culture. They have a very strong cultural identity. We use the natives for things like polar bear guards, and they're, they're happy to do this. They're happy to interact with us. We have good mutual exchange of information. Uh, it's, it's a much more respectful interaction, and, and we try to learn from the, the scientists on, you know, on there, and as Louie mentioned, they are the original scientists. They see the ice in a way that's, you know, helping them to live, and it's it's a very different way than I, as a, a Western scientist, would look at the ice. It's, it's really fascinating just to, to talk to them on that level and find that level of mutual respect. Whereas when I've been to Greenland, the native population interacts very differently because there it's with the military. The military displaced their village um, and so now the military base is more of like a stopping area. Uh, you know, it functions as an airport, maybe for them to, to get supplies every now and then. Um, but it's not nearly that respectful level of interaction or, you know, let's learn from each other. It's, hey, we're, we're coexisting here. They, they're amazing people. I mean, I'm just fascinated by, by how they survive, uh, how they thrive. Uh, but again, it's, it's very different in, in, in where I've been, just how I've interacted with the, the native populations. I just want to add some, one other thing, and I always think of this funny cartoon when, when I, I think of this, is there's a guy, an astronaut on the moon, he's walking, and he goes, ah, oh, shit, Vikings. Because it's like the Vikings went everywhere, and though they're not considered indigenous, the Vikings are, are an ancient culture who are based very much in an Arctic country in Norway, and if you think back to those long boats, imagine rowing a boat across from northern Norway across the Atlantic and landing in like eastern Canada. Just think of the technology and how, how these ancient cultures uh, and are, 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 were essentially um, in some ways an exploration military operation. Back then you didn't know where you were landing. You didn't know what you were doing and they were armed. So I think that uh, the Vikings are always in some ways forgotten, but very much in terms of early Arctic operations, we're very much always sailing some of the earliest incredible sailors that moved through the Arctic and actually uh, began to colonize Iceland and uh, Greenland. Actually, there are ancient Viking settlements in eastern Canada. Just imagine rowing one of those longships. I don't even know how... I mean, these are open, they're not like sail ships with decks, and this is a pretty long journey. Uh, just think of the navigating and, and the survival of going across that and through the Arctic, actually. So I do want to turn it over to Q&A, but um, I'm thinking maybe we can do a quick Mythbusters, and you can each say the biggest myth that you hear about the Arctic in your work that you want to bust publicly. <laughs> because Louie and I have talked a lot about the Arctic as this really imagined place. Like very few Westerners, you know, we're never probably going to go up to the Arctic. Well, who knows? But um, the penguins that, you know, Louie talks about people show, you know, there'll be a news story about the Arctic and there'll be a picture of a penguin, but penguins don't live in the Arctic. And so these types of like myths um, and narratives that surround the Arctic as a place, but just are not true. It, it, it's funny because the second image on Google image search of the Arctic has a picture of freaking penguins. <laughs> <laughs> and there's also these kids art books. And, and I'm just adding, I'm jumping in here, sorry. 
and it's got like you know a Himalayan Nepal thing with Arctic stuff, and it's like that's not even cl- the Himalayas aren't even in the Arctic, but you know it's this like a cold thing, right? Like oh, it's cold, it's got to be Arctic, you know. So anyway, I don't know if we, if we want to. I don't know if you. I, I've got one. Hit it. <laughs> uh, I've often seen the Arctic depicted, especially in paintings or kids shows. My kids are back there um, as these towering cliffs of ice. Yes, those exist. They're not everywhere. A lot of the Arctic is flat. It's just flat snow and it just extends, you know, as far as you can see, you go out on the the Greenland ice sheet and it's just endless or you're out on the, the pack ice. And yes, there's ridges, there's big blocks of ice. It is still very beautiful, but it's not these, you know, massive towering cliffs of ice everywhere and you're you're walking through them. Again, there are parts of the Arctic like that, but it's not everywhere. Um, there's always been a summer in the Arctic, and there's green kind of tundra. It's not grass. It's like a moss. But there's always been in the summer, and ice has always melted to a degree on the land, on the land part. If you look at the Arctic Circle, say in the northern Canada, there have always, there are seasons in the Arctic. It's not always frozen. So when people say the ice melts, the ice does melt. But, uh, you know, I'm not... The way he's talking about the ice melting is not great for the greater picture, but there has always been seasons. And the most common animal you'll see in the Arctic are ravens. They are very holy and respected birds in the Arctic. You'll see them as little characters. I put them in some of my photos back there. And I didn't realize until I read my own uh, subscription to National Geographic where I do Simon's is that it's got the largest brain of any bird and it's the smartest bird. Well, that smart can be many things of the whole of all birds so it is rare and hard to ever see a polar bear so you don't go up there and there's like oh hey there's a polar bear walking through town and so i just this is many miss Butters story but there's just so many over the years polar bears are cute but a polar bear will kill you with maximum violence so fast before you can blink so i have firearms training i had to get it to work in the arctic and they will go for your head like seals and crush your head like instantly. You don't have to become between it and its cubs to, for it to kill you. So Arctic, uh, sorry, polar bears, beautiful, but very deadly. I guess one of the, the things that um, may be surprising or may not be um, that sort of merges a couple of themes that we've talked about today is that when you think about the indigenous populations and development, uh, it's easy to say, well, the indigenous don't want anything to do with development because they want, you know, to live their pure, you know, lives. Those Traditional ways of life in many of these communities have been decimated by the colonization process. Um, and there are many communities, Louis mentioned the, the North Slope in, in Alaska, where people gain, the indigenous communities gain a significant amount from oil um, drilling. And so there, the, it's much more complicated than I, just to make it more complicated, there are other areas, such areas such as Russia, where they gain very little and they remain exploited. Um, and so it's, it's a much more complicated relationship. I would second that as well. It's not like everybody's protesting. No, some places want the jobs. There, you know, if you go in the archipelago of Canada, a flight to repul- uh, say Resolute uh, in the middle of the archipelago could be eight thousand dollars return. You know, uh, 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 a can of beans can be fourteen dollars. It's all shipping. You know, so hunting seal hunting like that. You know, th- this is this is a part of survival. You know, there's no jobs. There's nowhere to really work. So. I, I agree. Some places do want development. You know, they aren't. I, I've not seen anyone with a sled dog whipping the dogs going across the Arctic in Canada. There's some races. The I did a rod in Alaska, but these things. We're in a new time now. There, there is a obvious big energy to preserve. You know, indigenous the, the culture, the language, but you know, mm-hmm. the, they can. There, there are people, there are Inuit who are CEOs of big corporations as well. You know, this stereotype has changed. You know, this there, there are new ideas about what it means to be indigenous and live in the north as well. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to open uh, things up for questions. You can ask questions of each other and also, um, of course, the audience. Yeah. Um, questions for you. Um, so there's this book called Seasons Believing by Errol Morris, and it's basically about photos that are altered and doctored. 
to drive the way you think about what you're seeing. Um, your photos are a lens of things that we may never see. And I was wondering, my question is, what skills have you developed to document the unbiased truth, whether it's from indigenous peoples or from the military? What have you learned to what methods of approaching other people? So I, I, I think what's great about now compared to say, I think all, all of what we do, all three of us, what we do and anyone else here is we, there's kind of, uh, there's a lot of talks about ethics and the codes of ethics that we follow. We're like, hey, 40 years ago, I would never do it like that. I'm glad I wasn't. And so I think that we've learned from past mistakes. We've evolved. And so uh, I think training and going to school, I think the importance of authorship and oversight of authorship. So like, you know, if you want to know, that's why that little byline, anytime you read the news, the credit to the photo, like it's, you know, Susan Cole from Reuters, you'd be like, okay, Reuters is a news agency. I can trust Reuters. If she's lying or doing something wrong, not only will she get called up by her colleagues online, but Reuters will be like, hey, you're fired. You shouldn't have did that. There's a code we follow. You can look them up online. This is the the one benefit of this, of social media is you can look people up and go, Oh, wow. Okay. Or it says, you know, uh, Russian military handout. You're like, whoa, uh, that's a cool photo, but I don't think I can, I don't think I can accept whether that's truthful or not, or if it's whatever, a, some dictatorship in who knows where, and they don't let journalists in, you know, you know, you can look them up on the community to protect journalists or another resource, and you can connect the dots and say, this place doesn't even allow journalism. I can't trust that photograph. So when you look at my photographs, you can check me out, so to speak, right away. You can go to my website, you can go to my bio, and there's a link to the National Press Photographer Association Code of Ethics and how I work. And I think that that's really, really important. I think that there are different kinds of photographers, different kinds of visual artists and or journalists, writers. There are ones who do news, there are ones who do essays. And I think the important thing is for you to not just look at me, but look at everybody and kind of form your own opinion from there. No one has to like the way I take photographs, or maybe they do, or they maybe they want to look at me as a counterpoint to someone, how someone else photographs something, but also that, hey, I'm a white man. You want to look at someone maybe who's an Inuit photographer and look at all those diverse views of us as a community, you know, like there's communities that he belongs to and that he belongs to and that you look across all of it and you kind of compare it and it kind of, that's the beauty of this tool that we should be using is using it to sort of verify the information we're getting and say, oh, okay, Louis having a show here. He's working with this curator, this curator, this is her background. And I think that comes all back to what we all want is the importance of authorship. So like our favorite books is by this author. Here's their bio. This is where they studied. This is sort of where they're coming from. And you can use that to say, hey, I'm like that too. So this is something I can trust. And I think authorship is really important, you know, like peer reviewed studies, more, more maybe their worlds, you know, or they write for journals. And so there's a kind of a system that checks boxes, you know, that says, yeah, okay, this, these people are trustworthy. So I think the important thing is the most important tool, especially going into these communities is listening. It's just saying, I'm not here to take your picture yet. I must have made five trips to the Arctic before I took really any photos when I, when I was working on my project with National Geographic because I think a lot of people are just coming up here and, hey, I'm here to extract, like a re resource extraction of photos. And I'm here and say, hey, look, I want to do this project. What do you think? And then let them make the decision and say, these are the things, what are the things that, what do you want to get in front of audiences in the South? What, 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 what's at stake here? I'm, I'm the journalist, but I want to listen to you. I'm interested in what your perspective is. So a lot of them wanted to take me out on the land, take me hunting, take me fishing, sleep in tents together, go out, learn how to make rope out of seal skin, you know, doing incredible things, you know. So I think there was one, one, one ranger I went out with, David Naluk, whose great-grandfather was a Scottish whaler who came to Repulse Bay, which is now called Now Yet. And that's another decolonization is the renaming, like formerly Barrow, is now, you know, they're, all these towns are like Repulse Bay's now yet. They're going back to their original traditional names. He took me out on the land and he was half half and he taught me all these incredible things about how to watch the caribou, how to look at the fish. And it was like, I felt like it wasn't just looking at things observationally, but understanding how the planet functioned. And it was about learning. And I really felt like I came out of this as a student, not as much as a journalist.
But with so much science, so many research papers and stuff behind the paywall, like how do you guys think about navigating that like accessibility of science, not only to the people um, who are reading it, but the people who are doing it getting grants and stuff? Like how does one go about navigating that and trying to respect the knowledge and the people with maybe that's not fully accessible to people that don't have the opportunity to go and speak directly to those folks? That's a great question. I mean, I don't know if I have an answer for that. I don't know if you've thought about this. Uh, I, so I know at NASA and in the wider science community, there's this big push. They call it open science. And so they're trying to move beyond these paywalls. Um, I mean, in part, it's by having authors put more money <laughs> into the, the journal, and then it's then open access. Or there are actual, a lot of popular open access journals. And so... There's this, uh, yeah, big, big push towards at least the, the papers being made public. Um, there's also a bigger push, and this is going to take a lot, but it's towards methods and data being more accessible too. Method or data uh, is accessible, at least the, the government data is freely available, but it's got to be put in a useful form. And so this the program that NASA is doing, this open science, is towards, okay, if someone develops a code or something that was used in this paper, they have to provide that code, or they have to provide the methods behind what they did, or um, uh, there's also things like plain language summaries, things like that, where it's like, there is a big push to making it more accessible, but I, I realized to have a conversation with the, the native population that we're going to have to work with them in a different way because they're often looking for some, you know, specific kind of knowledge. Whereas, you know, maybe we collected it in this one way or we analyzed it this one way, but they're looking for something much different. And so uh, I'm also part of a, another group. Uh, it's called uh, IARPIC. It's a scientific uh, agency for different federal agencies trying to cooperate in the Arctic. And so we often... We're trying to grasp with this issue here of, okay, how do we engage with the, the indigenous population and find out what they want? Because again, it's just, it's starting the conversation. But like I said, we're, we're starting. It's going to be a while before I, I think we make real progress. Well, I don't know about, you know, the open journal. I mean, I think probably a bunch of things that I publish are not in open journals, right? They just you submit them, they get published, and you're happy. You put it on your CV and you talk to people about it, hopefully. Um, but I do want to say that um, in terms of research in the Arctic, it was made very clear um, when I was working on my NSF proposal um, that you have to have a plan to go back and present your findings to these communities. Um, and so I think everybody, at least anyone who gets an NSF, is, is doing that. And I think it's the same thing with the Canadians. And I think that's very common now. Um, and also um, a way to have your, um, all of your data in open source so that people can get your data. No, and, and listen, I hear you. So I, I have two experiences. Like, I'm not going to pick on any one publishers, but there's a couple of popular journal publishers, at least for photography and art. And they're like, wow, you know, you, you did this kind of work. You covered these many wars. Can you write a paper about that? So they propose it. We have a, a, a symposium. I write, for the first time I had to learn, I went to art school, suddenly after like Chicago style and all this <laughs> complex stuff. I'm like, whoa, man, I just want to express how I feel about the world, you know? And so I write it, and then, you know, it gets published in one of the popular, and I don't want to pick anyone because they're video recorded here, but one of those popular ones that you have to pay a lot of money for. And then one day I'm kind of like, oh, that's right. I can list like I've written like a published paper. And they wanted $70 for my own paper because I didn't know what page it was on. I was trying to make the – and I'm like, <laughs> this is like the ultimate, you know, getting like screwed, you know. And I, so I totally hear you. And then to top it off, you know – uh, I'm with all of us in the pandemic. We've tried different things. I've always wanted my MFA. So I'm in the final year of my low residency MFA at MICA. Well, there's all these like, you have to read all these theorists. I'm going looking for papers. I'm like, suddenly you get a, you're like, you're really into the knowledge. You're like, I need that book. And you know, you, the books are arriving, you're getting embarrassed. They're piling up. You're like, okay, wait, I can. And they're all like $50, $80, $120, some German study of narrative from the late 70s that connected to Bauhaus and Walter Benjamin, you know, say, I need that book, $160. It's, they'll need 10 copies. 
I'm making fun, but this is kind of true sometimes. Some out of date book on the end of the British Empire and documentary four by five large format. I must have that book. And before you know it, I've got like $10,000 of freaking books on my wall. So I, I'm, I'm making some fun because people are like, yes, I've been through that. And I totally hear you. And um, that's why I nearly almost always put all my photographs on my website that you can see. And actually, the, the story that we did in Nat Geo was published twice online, digitally, uh, uh, free. It wasn't behind the paywall. The Arctic particularly wasn't behind the paywall. So um, one thing I did um, when I covered the drug war in Mexico, uh, I was at a think tank, the New America Foundation. And I spent three years covering the U.S.-Mexico border. I covered a lot of organized crime, drug cartels. And it, it was exactly this. And I think it's just going to take these kind of conversations and these great hard questions to challenge, not, not us, because I think we're all with you, but that, that institution up there, that big, that big death star, so to speak, is that while I was down there, I thought, you know what? I found a local uh, uh, publication that covered politics in Mexico online. And I said, I will, I will first publish, first time rights publish all my work in the United States with these publications, but I want to publish with you. I will let you use my photographs for free if you translate all my writing into Spanish and publish on your website. So I did that and was like this great thing because suddenly uh, I, I'm, and, and everybody in Mexico was like, wow, this is great reporting. We can't report on this because we'll get killed by cartels. So I think that that was an example of the possibilities. And I think that it's about partnerships. And I think that, this system that we want to break down that you're talking about and I want to break it down wasn't created overnight and I think we need to slowly try and deconstruct it. There will be places where it has to be monetized because people have to get paid and I think that that's... So there's all these things that we got to keep challenging the system and keep trying to make these small fixes and these collaborations. Uh, I would also say your story is a plug for libraries. Lib oh, <laughs> damn, we're right... <laughs> But I got to say, I did some research on abstractionist work by women photographers, for real, for a project, and there's a great, incredible collection right through those doors right there. Uh, thank you. Yes, shameless plug, special collections, so do that same thing. <laughs> um, I know I saw a European Yeah. yeah. Um, so did you encounter yeah. much climate denial when you go to the Arctic, or is, are the changes stark enough? Uh, I don't recall ever encountering yeah, climate change denial in the Arctic. Uh, <laughs> plenty <laughs> around here. Uh, yeah, not none that I've really encountered in the, the Arctic. I'll just say that I was surprised by one of my Russian colleagues, um, a hydrologist, uh, who expressed a firm belief that there could be any number of reasons that the sea ice was melting, and that's why you know these, these, this town, town that we were looking at was getting decimated by the waves and erosion. Um, he made it very clear that he didn't think that climate change was human caused. Um, so I, it surprised me a lot. Um, I, I've never heard of in the Arctic because that was the question, but I'll tell you that. Um, I kind of retired from covering, I covered wars for many years. I thought I was very interested in democracy and covering politics in Washington, D.C., where I've been living for 15 years. And uh, I'll tell you that on Capitol Hill, you will hear a lot, and depending on who's in the White House, climate denial. Right now from the White House, you're not hearing it. But, you know, there's a lot of different people. And we come back to what I'm trying to talk about is narratives how people shape and manipulate narratives. This comes back to authorship and understanding who the sources of your information are. And that's why I think journalism has never been more important than now and sort of understanding the kind of journalism you're actually reading or looking at. Um, you know, there, there's so much manipulating of narratives that, you know, on January 6, 2020, uh, 2021, I was in the Capitol. After retiring from war, I'm like, what the hell, man? Like, you know, so people can... there. Narrative is a very powerful weapon that can be used to, to fool or manipulate people. It's like out of a science fiction film, and they can do it to climate change as well. You know, I cover a lot of hearings, different Senate and House hearings, and it's incredible sometimes the things I hear. But, you know, this is the thing, right? So this is about a democracy, and it's about what we're doing right now. We're in it together as a community. This is like an ancient, there are ancient forms of this, like when the the... Whatever animal is, is 
2,000 years ago starts killing villagers, we get together and we're like, okay, how are we going to deal with this? This is the problem, you know? And I think that that's what we're dealing with right now here. So this is the beginning of that, you know, fighting back on that. I got a question for uh, Kurt. You um, were talking about how you're using remote sensing to uh, measure like the thickness of the ice and uh, so underneath it to use it with the laser. Mm -hmm. And as far as I understand, um, penetrating ice with a laser is really hard to do. So I was just curious about what special uh, qualities the laser has that lets it um, access the ice and go through. Sure. Uh, yeah, the laser actually, what's special about it is how accurate. Um, we're up in space, 500 miles up in space, and we can measure height changes that are just uh, a few centimeters, like two centimeters. And so to measure the thickness of the floating ice, we use something called Archimedes principle. So it's this, I don't even know how many thousand year old principle, which is if you know how much ice is floating above the surface, you know, the density of the material that it's floating in and then the density of the, the material itself. In this case, it's water. We know the density of seawater. We know the density of sea ice with some uncertainty. We know the density of the snow on top of it with some uncertainty. Uh, you can back out what how thick the ice is above and below the, the water level based on how much is floating above. So um, yeah, it's, it's Archimedes principle is actually just basic algebra. You have the weight of the displaced uh, fluid, which is water, uh, and then you have the, your, your ice and your snow, and you, again, just based on the uh, height above water, you can do a bit of algebra and rearrange the equation. Usually when I, 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 I've often taught Arctic geography here, given like a special lecture, and I'll, I'll always show that, because again, it's just pretty simple algebra to, to go through. It's pretty mind-blowing for simple algebra. <laughs> we, we need to clone him. Like, I mean another hundred of him. When we're, we're measuring the uh, change of, of ice, uh, unlike the Greenland ice sheet or Antarctica, it's very important that, that accuracy as well, because there we're actually looking at just the height change. Um, so there we can't see how thick it is, we're, uh, unless we have a radar which can see through the, the bottom. Um, and so, yeah, it's depending on whether it's on ice or land, but that's the physical quantities. Can I ask, I am very ignorant about lasers. Was it developed specifically for this purpose, or this was an existing technology they used after for this purpose? Uh, a bit of both. So the satellite that I work on, ISAT-2, um, used ex some existing technology, like the, the laser itself, um, some of the detectors and, and things like that. A lot was built specifically for the satellite. There, there's more than just the laser shooting in the detectors. It, it also has to do with, especially we have to really know how uh, very accurately where we're pointing on the, the surface of the Earth. So you're hundreds of miles above the surface of the Earth. And so it's using this sophisticated technology, star trackers, it's using, it's looking at the, the field of stars and based on that we can get some idea. Um, and yeah, the, the detectors for uh, like keeping the, the laser beam aligned with where it should be uh, and then counting these individual photons that are returned um, is, was a lot of technology. Yes, it is LIDAR, yes. LIDAR changed the world of seismology. Yes, yeah, that's a very good example. Um, so, yeah, the, the accuracy of these laser altimeter, the, the LIDAR has gotten very good, both, well, from space, like ISAT-2 is able to do, but also from, from airplanes as well. Mm -hmm. um, so there, you can't use a star tracker. You use uh, position sensors, which since the, the pitch roll heading of the, the aircraft. Uh, it doesn't work as well from the air. You can't necessarily do as good a job. Uh, you can get more spatial coverage and things like that. But So there's a lot of room for technology development here. But um, yeah, so it's one thing that NASA's investing in, you know, what's the next generation of a, a LiDAR in space. I think we're going to 
wrap up the Q and A. We could have time for one more question if anyone has any. Okay. So if not, I just want to thank all of the panelists again. This was really <laughs> So awesome. Yeah, so awesome. Here. So awesome. Back. Thank Thanks you. This was fit. Thank you. This is great. Thank you. Yeah. This is really awesome. I just felt like when you got the ladies.